for eight hours. Uh, welcome everyone. Today we will have the pleasure Sorry. to uh, listen to uh, Jenny Bertamen from uh, the University of Reading. Welcome. Thanks very much, and uh, I want to thank the organizers, and especially Percy, Dave, for an opportunity to speak here. And uh, so let me just start by uh, um, giving some um, background. So we're going to be looking at um, pretty much everything that I speak about will be related to the uh, XY model. And um, this is probably well known um, and studied for several decades. Uh, but let me just um, remind you of the um, Hamiltonian, so we have, um, actually draw a picture here, so this is the uh, one-dimensional um, system. So we have some lattice sites here, go up to some n, so k equals 1 to n, and then we have the um, parameter, and I will specify what we mean by this, and uh, we have just the, uh, the nearest neighbor uh, interactions and here the uh, sigma kx, and, um, and the next one, uh, these are the uh, Pauli matrices um, acting on sort of one half spin operators on each lattice site. And uh, we have similarly, we have um, with respect to this. And then we have the, um, the magnetic field um, with respect to um, So here, the, uh, the, um, the gamma parameter, this is the um, anisotropic um, or anisotropy uh, parameter. And um, we are looking at the case, well, there are two cases to consider. Um, one is um, when the parameter equals 0. So here we get the uh, xx model, and, um, and also known as the isotropic isotropic. Um, so this is the isotropic uh, XY model here. And what we assume about H, uh, so, um, so the first case, if I just mention a few things about how this, um, when this model was considered for the first time, that was the um, Lieb, uh, Schultz, and, and Mattis. And they uh, introduced this model um, already some time ago. And they, um, uh, they studied some uh, fundamental properties of this system. For example, they found the, the ground state and some other elementary properties um, uh, back then. But this was only in the case when um, there was no magnetic field, the, the first study of, of this model. And um, then there were some other uh, works. Uh, for example, um, um, Baruch, uh, McCoy, and, and Dresden, uh, they also considered this uh, um, model, uh, the XY model. And um, what they considered uh, were the, um, say, fundamental uh, correlators. of this model. And this was um, also uh, quite a uh, long time ago in the 70s. So uh, these were some of the first uh, results uh, on the model. And um, of course, there has to be a reason why you would consider something like this. And one of the, the reasons, as far as I know, of these three considering the model was that they wanted to see the effect of the uh, anisotropy parameter on the one-dimensional setting. So what sort of role it plays. And um, there are some other um, observations about, about this model. It's obviously, it's uh, quite uh, simple, and I think in some sense the simplest um, model, say um, non-trivial integral model, where you have still um, some critical and non-critical regimes. So we'll see. I, I will draw the phase diagram, and that will explain what I, what I meant by that, if you haven't seen the, uh, the phase diagram of this model. And uh, there are some other particular cases here. Uh, one is when the, um, this parameter is plus or minus 1, then we get the uh, 1D easing um, uh, in this case. And um, 
you could also um, ask, so if you want to describe the uh, correlators of the, of the model, how do you express them? And uh, one way of doing that is to use fred home determinants, or you can use, um, let me add it here, fred home determinants. Um, or and or multiple integrals. But the problem with this is that the expressions are quite complicated and if you want some explicit um, um, quantities then um, these may give you an expression but the expression itself is, is not obvious um, what, it, what it says exactly. Um, so I want to mention uh, one other correlator. Um, I'll continue here a little bit more. So, um, one, so these were studied quite a lot, long time ago, um, but more recently um, there have been a number of uh, papers on uh, emptiness formation probability. So this is EFP. And what that tells you, if you denote that probability by Pn, this will tell you the, uh, the, the, the probability that you have n consecutive um, uh, spins with the same orientation, all pointing down, or usually so pointing down. And so, um, at least asymptotically, here, if you want to study the uh, emptiness formation probability, you can use templates determinants. So that will be another um, um, main object uh, of my talk together with the uh, XY model is, is to uh, represent the um, um, <laughs> So this is, um, you can very effectively study the emptiness formation probability uh, using Teplis determinants. And um, so let me denote Teplis matrices by um, capital T sub n. And then we have some uh, symbol. Um, and it should relate to the, uh, so let's say that the um, anisotropic, uh, anisotropy uh, parameter is given. And then we have here depends, dependence on, uh, on the magnetic field. And so, could, could you just say again what the emptiness formation probability is? Yeah, so this will give you the, the probability of uh, having n consecutive, um, so where is the picture? So n consecutive uh, spins with the same orientation. So for example, pointing down, uh, what's the probability? And, um, and this is, of course, um, well, those of you who know um, uh, the, uh, the theory of Teplis determinants, um, what we can do here quite effectively is to find the asymptotics. So let me just try to distinguish between n and h. Um, so for fixed h, this is something that you can um, compute easily by using um, old results. So let me um, here um, draw the phase diagram and also give you the expression um, of the um, of the of the symbol that generates a tuplet matrix, and I guess I should also uh, let me put it here to say what tuplet matrices are. So if you have a symbol F, then uh, this is simply the matrix whose um, diagonals are constant. J and K are both uh, non-negative. Um, say an n by n matrix. Um, so this has been studied for more than, um, more than 100 years and a lot about the um, determinants of Teplis matrices are now understood really well. Um, and this connects with those classes of symbols that are well understood. So here we have uh, is theta as a parameter, yeah, one, one half, and then we have uh, cosine theta minus h plus i, and then the uh, gamma parameter, sine theta divided by um, cosine theta minus h squared plus gamma sine theta squared. 
And then we still have to take the square root and multiply by 2. Now, if you look at this, you can see uh, immediately one thing that um, if this, um, if H, uh, the magnetic field, um, is less than minus 1, so let's put that here on the uh, imaginary axis. So let's say this is 0, and then we have uh, minus 1 here. So if H is less than minus 1, then it's easy to see that uh, sigma H is, is smooth, it's actually analytic. Uh, it has no zeros, that's also obvious. And it has no winding. And for such symbols, we can simply apply uh, the strong Zago limit theorem. And we get the answer of um, uh, asymptotic uh, result in Pn. So that's one case. Let's denote that by sigma minus. So this is a non-critical um, uh, region here below the, uh, the line minus 1. And then we have uh, two other cases is when um, H is, so the second case is when H is between uh, minus 1 and, um, and 1. And here uh, si the, the, si the situation gets more complicated. Um, in the first case, um, it should be, um, that's a good question. So when you compute the, uh, the asymptotics of the tuplets, I thought it would be non-zero. Um, so I thought, that, I thought the strong Zagol limit theorem would give you a non-zero limit in this case, but um, I'll have to look it up. Um, and um, in the second case, uh, there you get a singularity, which is also, um, you, you can see quite easily that if you, if you look at the expression um, sigma h, uh, then uh, this has one uh, Fischer-Hartwig singularity. And uh, the, uh, the singularity is at, uh, let me just quickly mention that, um, mm -hmm. at minus 1. So let me uh, draw here a picture, too. And now in this situation, um, you can use um, Fisher-Hardwick asymptotics. And you get the uh, again the answer the asymptotics of um, of p n uh, for large n. Um, but I should have looked up the the actual um, um, values. Um, now the next case is is more complicated for a couple of reasons. Um, well, you still get. Um, Fisher-Hartwig singularities, but you get two. You get two singularities at these two points. And uh, for those who, um, let me just put it here. If you are familiar with Fisher-Hartwig singularities, in this case, the, the strengths of the singularities are one over two. And uh, for those who haven't seen Fisher-Hardwick singularities before. These are singularities that have two types of singularities. One is the jump type, and that's related to the beta strength. And then the root type, um, let me just put it here. This is the root type uh, singularity uh, within the expression for, uh, for this function here. So you can actually single out uh, expression of this type from that when you factor it. And, and the beta one is just, um, I guess, this sort of picture would. So there is a jump at um, minus 1. OK, um, so here, as I said, we get two Fisher-Hardwick singularities. And um, 
And these two singularities are located at minus 1 and 1. And uh, let me just uh, say what the, um, the strengths are. And that's where things get more interesting because um, beta 1 equals 1 half and uh, beta 2 is minus 1 half. So that obviously implies that if you look at the difference uh, of these two, you get precisely 1. And this is um, the sort of special case, the baser tracy uh, conjecture um, that you can use to compute the asymptotics. So And this is the conjecture that was, uh, um, well, I think it was partially solved before Percy's work with Igor Krasovsky and uh, Alexander Itz, but uh, sort of complete answer was given um, in 2011, if I remember correctly. Um, so these are the three cases um, that we have to consider. And uh, of course, we have here, so this is another um, uh, non-critical regime. And then we have these uh, uh, two critical lines. When we cross them, we have phase transitions. And then we may, ha we may want to um, describe um, these transitions And these can be nicely uh, studied using um, um, some recent work. So this involves um, now looking at uh, uniform asymptotics of the tuplet determinants. Which means that um, if you are sufficiently close, um, Say, if you are looking at uh, the first transition, so then you have H is um, very close to 1. And you can write uniform asymptotics as um, n goes to infinity. And this is the, the work that um, Kleiss, uh, it's an Krasovsky uh, did, um, I think if I remember correctly, 2013. And then you have another transition here um, when, you, um, when you cross the, the other uh, critical regime. So that would be 1 minus epsilon. And, and what happens there is that you have, um, so when, you, when h is below minus 1, you have no, uh, no singularities. And when you cross to the, uh, the next regime, then you get one additional uh, fischer hardwig uh, singularity. So can you explain again the Hamiltonian? x, y, and z are components of the spins, or they're just powers? Uh, these are Pauli matrices. So uh, I could, I could let, me, let me just add it here. Uh, using, say, alpha. So for alpha is x, y, or z, uh, these are. Um, So these describe the, um, I think you call them one half spin operators acting on each um, um, site um, of, of the system. OK. And here, uh, so here there is a, a slightly more complicated situation. There is again an emergence of a singularity. And the singularity emerges right here. But in addition to that, um, there is one fixed singularity, because when you go from this non-critical, you already have one fixed singularity that does not depend on the parameters h. And then when h goes to the critical value, then you get one more. So you could also think of it uh, more generally if you are just for mathematical interest, this would be the case when uh, your symbol gets uh, one additional uh, singularity. And also uh, the work of Kleisitz and Krasovsky, this was sort of um, in a much more general setting where you have um, 
singularities that are not necessarily related to this or any other uh, system. But it does also cover the, um, uh, the 2D easing model, uh, their work, which, is, which I don't have time to discuss here, but that's. These results A, B, and C, are they for all values of gamma? Gamma this is gamma is positive. So this is in the um, non-isotropic case. So gamma should be positive. Um, so I should have set here. So let's suppose here that gamma is is positive. And uh, here you get so. Um, so that's of course the um, the um, 1D easing model case. Um, this is the uh, um, I don't recall that there is a restriction on that, but I would have to look it up too. It's it's things do get more complicated when you want to express this uh, particular symbol uh, in the form of the uh, Fisher-Hardwick singularities in 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 this uh, case uh, C. Uh, in order to factor those out, um, it's more, um, well, it's not really involved, but it it's still uh, requires more work. Uh, and this was, um, so the general case from one to two, this is something that um, uh, with one of my uh, former uh, PhD students, um, uh, we did um, um, some time ago, well, recently. Um, that if you want to find this, I think this will be sufficient to find it. And this is in uh, nonlinearity. And, and so if, if there is any of my own work, then um, you'll find it, um, um, you'll find a preprint or the reprint um, on that uh, web, uh, page. If you want to get to know more uh, details of, of this case. So this. Um, in many ways completes the study of uh, emptiness formation probability both well this was already known using using the um, um, standard theory of um, topless determinants and their asymptotic behavior um, and then this is more recent uh, to look at uh, transition asymptotics or double scaling limits which I think is um, so this is just a couple of cases, but you could ask many other um, uh, questions where you have um, a symbol and say you want to know uh, what happens um, as, uh, so you are interested in asymptotics, but at the same time uh, t goes to some critical value um, and then um, there could be a change in the number of Fisher-Hardwick singularities or something else can happen. And th these sort of questions um, are not, of course, are, are not restricted to topless determinants, but uh, more widely um, there have been um, some studies in, in random matrix theory. I think in, in, in Percy, Percy Dave's recent open problem paper, you mentioned uh, some, there is a good description of um, what this means, uh, double scaling limits in random matrix theory, and I think um, there, are not, there are not too many theoretical results, but numerical results do exist. So I think that's something interesting to consider. Um, I could say, but I'm starting to run out of time, so maybe I just mention without writing anything, is that uh, methodologically, um, if you want to know more about how you can actually compute the um, these asymptotics, so this is, of course, the most classical result. And um, if you look up, um, if you look at uh, Barry Simon's uh, orthogonal polynomials in the unit circle uh, book, you'll find, if I remember correctly, six proofs or, or so, nine proofs, OK. Um, <laughs> and um, I think related to this talk, it's, um, it's one um, is, um, Maybe I'll just quickly write a couple of um, approaches to the uh, to these matters here. Um, this was 1991 or, or so, some time ago. But in a, in a recent book by um, Percy, Dave, and, um, and and two others, this is also um, 
this approach to the strong Sago limit theorem is explained. And then uh, what I like um, personally a lot is the um, approach by Widom and uh, also sort of related approach by Helton uh, using operator theory um, to uh, describe the asymptotics in a smooth case. So this is A. Uh, B would be, um, again, um, what I said already, it's uh, Daft, it's and uh, Krasowski is the Riemann-Hilbert uh, approach. But there is still operator theoretic approach um, in B. And uh, this is, um, is actually a series of papers uh, by many authors over, um, I think, uh, maybe two, three decades. Um, how you can deal with this using operator theory. But what, when it comes to um, complete solution of the Bayes or Tracy conjecture, then you only have, um, as far as I know, this paper using Riemann Hilbert analysis. I think it's uh, unfortunate that there is no operator theoretic proof of the Bayes or Tracy conjecture, which probably can be done uh, but hasn't been done. Um, OK, so that's, that's some approach. And these two here, uh, transition asymptotics, uh, these are all obtained uh, using riemann hilbert problems. And uh, the solutions are related to uh, Pinelove equations. So that, that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say about um, um, about emptiness formation probability. And the next uh, topic is the um, entanglement. And so I'm really, um, so what we have done, we have um, computed um, uh, what is called the limiting entropy. So we have, so when you measure entanglement, you can measure it in different ways. But uh, the situation we have looked at is, the, um, is actually the isotropic case, so the XX uh, model. Um, so this is the case where the parameter gamma, so the um, anisotropy parameter equals 0. So there we get the XX model. And um, here, uh, this is uh, what you could call the uh, bipartite system. And, and here, uh, the von Neumann entropy um, is, um, uh, I guess I could say, the most commonly used, Maybe you could argue it's the best way to measure uh, entanglement in this particular situation. And um, so I don't want to get into uh, discussing entanglement, but um, I thought of just mentioning um, one thing um, when I was looking at before, uh, before, the, before the talk, which I thought was interesting, is the, the, the first um, image of the um, entanglement um, uh, was just recently um, done in the University of Glasgow. But don't ask me about I mean, I cannot explain what this, some of you may know, um, was fully going on here. But this is um, just a short um, um, announcement of something that you can find more about if you are interested. And then if you go way back, um, uh, you also have the um, Einstein, I um, oh, forgot the name. Yes, and, um, and Rosen uh, uh, experiment or, uh, or, or paradox. Um, and that's 1935. And in a way, um, um, this, uh, what, what, how you can maybe look at it, and more generally entanglement, is that it's sort of um, 
shows the difference between classical physics and quantum physics in, in some ways um, when you deal with these sort of things. Um, OK, so, so this is the setting. And um, I could just um, write it here. So what we are interested in is the, uh, the von Neumann entropy. And this is, uh, so if you have a density matrix, you take minus trace of. And the task that we have is to actually, we didn't have a task of expressing this in any way. We could use the, uh, the work of um, Corpin and Yin. So they had a way of expressing the, um, uh, the entropy in, in a way that you can much more easily compute. And again, that involves Toeplitz determinants. Um, before, I should add here just a note. There were some works um, on um, uh, computing the uh, entropy for some uh, spin chain models, including XY model. Um, numerically, and then uh, what Korepin and Jin did, they they could sort of rigorously show and confirm those results um, using an expression that I'm going to um, write down in a second. Um, now there are many other works, of course, and um, um, I, I I should probably mention um, Keating and Metsadri, and this is. Um, also in connection with random matrix theory, as spin chains often are closely re related to, to such things. So uh, here, uh, this work goes back to 2004. This one I don't remember. And this is around the same time as this one. And this is the uh, XX case here. You can also, um, so the expression that you, you, can, um, you can get for the entropy also works in the XY model. But, um, um, and I think you can actually compute it in the, um, when you have one block. So let's say here's the system. And, and this could be. Uh, system A, and then what the rest here is B. So this is the situation that has been that was studied by uh, Korepin and Jin. So you have a system that consists of two. Well, you have basically one block, and then you have the rest of the system. And then you want to study the mutual information between, um, between this block and the rest of the system. So that's what they did. And um, there was one more result involving this situation of one block and the rest of the chain, uh, where it's, and then Korepin and Yin, um, or, or Jin, uh, considered in the XY case. So a natural question, once you have results on this type of um, um, subsystem of consisting of one block is to consider what happens if you have two blocks and some gap between them. So let me uh, indicate that next. Say we have uh, m particles, and then we have um, some gap that consists of uh, k particles. Maybe I'll denote it like. like this. And then you have, um, so here we would have m plus k plus 1 going up to m plus k plus n, and so on. So now we have this gap. And um, ultimately, what we would like to do is to um, compute entropy again. Um, the limiting entropy when m goes to infinity and n goes to infinity, and also the gap uh, goes to infinity. So that would be what 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 one would like to do. Um, 
And uh, this is, so I think I have some time to show what that involves. Um, uh, the computation of. Could you say a little bit more about what, what entanglement is, say, for this ID system? Um, so, entanglement, you mean in, in general, so that. that Just for that system, and what are you actually computing? So, um, maybe if I express it, and then I kind of can try to uh, explain that, uh, what, what that means in. So, um, so um, we need to define a few things uh, before I can give you the uh, the expression for for the uh, for the entropy. So we have a very simple function, but it, it has uh, jumps. And it's minus one otherwise. And uh, then, obviously, um, uh, the corresponding templates uh, matrix is uh, is self-adjoint, and we also know that its spectrum is contained in minus one one. That follows easily by looking at the values of G. And then we can express uh, we can um, consider the following matrix. Um, and this is sort of this is the matrix that will be used to express the the entropy in any one of these cases, um, and the uh, the diagonal um, uh, blocks are expressed in terms of uh, templates matrices. So A11 is uh, T M minus T M of G. Uh, A22 is uh, Tn, also minus Tn of G, and then 1, 2 is um, it's actually the same as A21 transpose, and this is given in the following form. Um, and this really demonstrates um, the, the problems that you encounter if you if if k goes to infinity or if k is large. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to write down how that looks like, and that um, is given. So each entry is given as a determinant of a matrix, and the size of that matrix uh, depends on k, and that's the reason why we've done the case k equals one. Um, so let me just quickly write what a i j is. So it's the negative determinant of these Fourier coefficients. Well, these are um, easy to compute, of course. Um, so you have a simple function like this. You can compute the Fourier coefficients easily. Um, but the problem comes, um, so where you, and uh, you, can, you can show that um, if, um, if, if, you, if you're looking at the kth Fourier coefficient of g, then it's 0 for all k even. So here you have a 0. And so this further simplifies in this case. Um, um, so this is when k equals 1. And uh, in the general case, um, we get. Um, k plus 1 times k plus 1 matrix, um, which you can probably do once you've done the case k equals 1, as we have. But that would be a lot of work. And um, well, I think it would be interesting, but um, is there an eraser? Or maybe I could. Yeah, maybe I'll just use it. Sure. I think maybe it's quicker if I, if I use this until I run out of space. Um, and now, so here is uh, finally the, uh, um, how you can express the, uh, so P here refers to what we had here. So here P was, in this particular case, P is
that's this one interval. And in this case, uh, P consists of two intervals. So you have one, two, up to M. And then you have the other piece here, which is M plus K plus one up to M, M plus K plus N. And uh, the expression that you get is the following. Um, this has an integral that needs to be computed. I will uh, uh, describe the, um, uh, the contour of integration in a second, but let me just first uh, write here what we, what we get in what uh, Gene and co Repping did. And uh, so here, the function e is the following. And then you have the logarithm. And this will make things more complicated. So you have to look at some cuts. And um, minus. And then um, the determinant here is um, is the determinant of lambda minus a, and a is the matrix given here. So this is the expression that Jin Korepin derived, and then uh, using so this one you can in the case of one interval you can uh, compute this uh, much more easily than when you have two intervals. And again, you can use the, um, um, well, part of the solution is, is based on using the Fisher-Hardwick asymptotics in this case. Um, and here is the, uh, the contour. So here we have uh, minus 1, 1. And here we have uh, 1 plus epsilon. And here we have minus 1 minus epsilon. And we have this orientation. And you can, you can for example, take, um, so if you fix your epsilon, then you, you can choose any, any contour will work. Uh, doesn't have to be a circle, uh, but that that works well here. Now, one more thing that um, Gene and Korapin did was that um, you can um, express, so here this refers to the case in which you have n number of particles in the system, um, and then the rest of the system is just the remaining particles. And uh, so you get exactly the same as what we have here up to the uh, logarithm, which is now the, uh, the templates determinant with the following symbol. So we have um, the function g plus lambda. And so this gives the entropy um, of, of the system. And then the rest is. Now, what do you get in the one interval case? Actually, the number. Um, um, let me see if we can. So, we've done the two interval case, and um, so what you want to find out is the. Um, so you want to compute. Um, So 
So this is the case when uh, we have two intervals. So how you can um, look at this is to use uh, the results of Dean and Korepin, which expresses these um, uh, subsystems uh, precisely. Um, so it gives the entropy in, in these two cases. And then if you want the case two, what you, what you have to study is the following. Um, so we have the... Um, the first part up to m and then you have with n particles and then you subtract um, the whole thing um, and then you can compute this so we know these expressions and we, we can put them all together under the same integral and what we get is the limit when epsilon goes to zero 1 over 2 pi i. Then we have this function exactly written in the same way as there. But then the remaining part of this um, is given by looking at these expressions, this one, and then the one that we derived, or, or which was given right here. So this term is log d m. minus the uh, n by n template matrix determinant. And then we have um, minus log of d of lambda, d lambda. So once, once we have this expression, now we want to compute the limiting entropy, so we have to take the limit both n and m go to infinity. And when we do that, um, we should first compute what we have here, and then take the n m limit to infinity, which we cannot do. So what we end up doing is, um, is this. So this is a part that is, is not completely rigorous, but this is what one would expect for the, um, for the entropy. And um, about how one can compute this, um, one approach which we used is to express what we have here um, in terms of um, integrable operators. And, and that involves the inverse of the tuplice matrices that um, we have used here. So I could actually quickly, um, quickly, quickly write that down. So this part here, this you can write as the logarithm of E lambda, and you can easily see how you can rearrange that. So you get a uh, logarithm of d lambda divided by the other two. And then you can express d lambda hat as the following in inner product. And this, you have a nice expression for this, in which comes out of out of this. But I don't have time to actually give that. But it's it's not difficult to work out. And then what you do is you use the um, integrable operators with the following kernel. So there you have a singularity, 
and you can express it in the following way. And then, well, you have just the integrable operator with that kernel integrate over the circle and um, and once you have this then you can um, express the inverse of this And that's how you get the um, uh, what is often called the uh, YK Riemann-Hilbert problem. And here, the boundary conditions are given in L2 sense. And then you can connect that with the more familiar Y Riemann-Hilbert problem, where you have um, continuous boundary values up to the boundary. And then the final, one of the final steps is to, to um, connect it with the R Riemann-Hilbert problem. And then you have the um, local and, uh, and global parametrices. And that will give you a solution. And then you go back and sort of, well, this is very vague and quick description. But there is, it's to, to carry out the Riemann-Hilbert analysis, that's, that's um, well, a lot of work. And it's quite complicated. So thanks very much. I think my time is up, right? Can you say what the answer is? Oh, yeah. In, so the answer is um, specifically, I think, uh, so this is what we compute. And that this is what we get. And um, that, that's, the, that's the specific answer. We haven't, um, so uh, as I said before, there were numerical studies of these. And I don't know if. You can you if, you if you can actually evaluate them in the xx case and compare this, but once you have this expression, there is. I, I think you can um, you can I don't know enough numerical analysis how well you can actually look at this because um, if you wanted to do for example uh, for a large k, you can probably implement some numerical methods to to compute the entropy also in that case, but this is uh, what we get precisely. In when, when k equals 1, the size of gap is 1.